So 40 million and counting on one streaming platform alone and that version, written by Peter Green, released as a single in 1968. Time then for me to say hello to the producer of the track. Welcome, Michael, William, Hugh, Vernon, producer, <laughs> engineer, musician, music executive. How are you? I'm fine, I'm fine. Thank you. How does it feel to listen back to that? Well, it comes, it, actually, it's a bit weird today because I didn't expect it to be in stereo. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm used to hearing the mono version. Yeah. Which, uh, but yeah, I mean, it uh, doesn't quite have the edge, maybe, that uh, the mono has. Well, I'm sitting here and, and the drums are coming out good and loud. T- yeah. Tell us about the personnel on that track. Well, it's Mick Fleetwood, John yeah. McVie, Peter Green. That's Did he always have bit, that it. style of drumming? Oh, yes. It was entirely his thing, you know. It's probably one of the reasons why actually he kind of lost the job with John Mayle, because he wasn't with John for very long. Right. He knew about sort of, I think it was six weeks or something like that, laughably short. He actually appeared in the studio to record yeah. with John, and then they did a series of, of um, gigs, and um, that was when Peter fell in love with his drumming. You know, that that's why, that was the time when Peter decided, I'm going to leave John Mayle and get my own band. What was the vibe like in the studio at the time? When we made this track? This, the, the one we just heard, oh, it the was Black very, Magic It was woman. a very very creative period of time, it really was. And, um, you know, I think it shows in in the, uh, the the way that they perform the record. There's a, you know, I mean, I'm happy, I'm going to, uh, you know, make this work kind of attitude towards it. It was 1968. Mm-hmm. What was it about the blues at the time that called you all? I think it was, um, I mean, John Mayle himself had a lot to do with that and uh, his predecessors, I suppose, in terms of, you know, we look at Chris Barber and Alexis Corner, yeah. Long John Baldry, yeah. and to a, a lesser degree, the, the Rolling Stones and the Yardbirds, but it mm-hmm. was John Mayle that kind of really pushed very, very hard. He, he, he worked very hard, he toured around in, in the clubs in those days, but yeah. not, of course, with the uh, dynamite guitarist that Eric Clapton was to become when he became a, a blues breaker because the transition from being with the Yardbirds yeah. to being on the, the Beano album and sounding the way he sounded, it's like night and day. Mike Venom, we're going to talk about how you got involved in the fanzine and the label and everything in a little while, but let's have some more music because we're going to play it. We're going to play it six minutes, 55 seconds of it. Need your love so bad. You've picked to play particular versions. Version two, remake, take two. <laughs> and what are we going to hear? Because you can hear somebody talking. Is that Peter talking on this? It's Peter talking at the beginning, yes. Well, t- to set the scene of the studio, what was the well, vibe I, th- like? Th- this was a, re- a remake. I mean, there was another... We had a, quite a few attempts at actually recording this song. Because it's not an easy song to perform, I think, which is why a lot of people avoid it. Because really, yeah, it's BB King is the um, probably is the most famous version, mm. but the original version, Little Willie John, is yeah. is a whole different ball game. It's actually quite busy. It's quite jo- joy. You know, yes, it's, it's yes. much faster. Yes, it is. So I was going to ask you about that. So that was released in 1955, and we should say happy birthday as well to William Edward John. He was um, well, he would to mark his birthday. He was born November 15th, 1937, in Arkansas, and I think he wrote this song, yes. or his brother wrote it. Do you no, know? No, I think his brother wrote it, but I think he, you know, I think it was written for him. What's interesting is it's about writing uh, on a piece of paper so mm. it can be read to me, which would. In, w- would appear that possibly he was illiterate. Okay. Only possibly. I, I have yeah, no. We don't know no, for no, sure. We don't know for sure. So, what did Peter Green do it then? Did it did did he talk about what he was going to do with this song, or did it just come out this no, way? No, we, we both uh, we said we. I told him, look, we need a new song for a single. We need one urgently. Yeah. And he said. I say, well, why don't we do Need So Bad? Because I love that, I love that. But he was talking about the B.B. King version. Right. He wasn't talking about the Little Willie John version. Okay, okay. Which I'm sure he had heard. Yeah. But uh, he, he took the B.B. King version as the blueprint. Yeah. But it was very difficult trying to get it to work. For some reason, John McVie and Mick had a problem with the start of it and, and the, just the feel of it. Yeah. Because it is very, very ethereal in, in, yeah. in a way and it's very very bare yeah uh, it, it's all about the vocal and the guitar and 
when I suggested to Peter that we should add strings to it, he almost passed out. Were the strings added after? Yes, they were added after. And it actually is this session. This is the version that was recorded without the strings and then the strings were added, along with horns. So good vibe in the studio, but a bit, bit nervous. Yeah, I, I think I think he he loved the song so much, and he wanted to make it right at the very end. If it's the one, that you, if you pick the right one, cause I hope my, I have. Well, it, it, it's, it's a tricky one, but right at the end, he does. He does. If I'm not mistaken, he actually swears. So you might want to fade it just a little bit at the very end. I think our team have probably cleaned it up a little, Mike. <laughs> BBC Radio 2, let's have a listen. We love to, you'll have to wait. You can't go anywhere if you're listening at home and see if the swear words yeah. are going to be in there or not. Here we are then. Fleetwood Mac, Need Your Love, So Bad. <laughs> I'll mark the ending up. <laughs> he didn't say the F one. It's no, mucked it either. up, thankfully. <laughs> um, did you know that you had a brilliant take at that point? Yeah. We, I did. We all did. Well, I mean, don't, don't think we thought it was going to be as big as hit as it was. Because you put it out as a single? Well, we put it out as a single, yeah. but not the entirety. We faded it through the first lengthy guitar solo. Did you like doing the fades, Mike? Yes. They were the, that was the fun part. <laughs> Did you, you know, do it with we, the bands and the musicians, or did you just go right? No, that's no, a bit no, long. I'm going to fade I, it out. I now. usually did the mixes without them. Did you? Yeah, I bet. Well, I, I tried to, but sometimes it was impossible. I'm just looking at some of the personnel. Obviously, we've got the string players, some horn players, the beautiful arrangements yeah, by. Yeah, yeah. The, remind us who it was. Mickey, Mickey guitar baker. And then we've got Pete Green on an amazing vocals. Mm-hmm. Did he always sing like that? Was he consistently a great uh, singer? He, he he was consistently a good singer. I don't think yeah. there's anything about any doubt about that. Yeah. But I think sometimes he was very very. If he was in the mood, he could d- deliver. Yeah. He could really deliver some spine chilling things. He did that with Man of the World. Yeah, absolutely. Then, yeah. John McPhee on bass, Mick Fleetwood on drums. What st- strikes me listening closely to that is his laziness on the yes. snare, which yes. is just spot on. Yeah, it's 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 rare. Especially for if, yeah. Well, if, I mean, you you hear it more when you go into the <laughs> s- southern states, don't yes, you, in the I south, know, where it's hot and it just seems yeah, natural to be natural, kind of lazy. It is. Yes, it's, it's it's that lazy behind the beat. So where did he learn? I have no that? idea. It's just one of those things that you know he was able to do it without even being asked to do it, which is yeah. took a bit of pressure off me. And then Christine Perfect. I know, she played played really well on this, and uh, the, the actual uh, organ, uh, Hammond organ, was not really her first instrument. Yeah. And she was, uh, you know, always <laughs> having problems with the foot pedals and stuff, but yeah. she did a really good job. Yeah, amazing stuff. Yeah. Well, we've got so much great music you brought into play. Thank you, Mike Vernon, if you're just joining us. It is Mike Vernon uh, of Blue Horizon, music executive label, fanzines. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, tried that once <laughs> and we're going to be talking about music you're still making music as well but so many people have got in touch with us via Twitter and text and everything Karis thanks for playing Black Magic Woman I'm Peter Green I'm a Peter Green fan it doesn't um, matter stereo or mono you played it that matters Keith and Manchester thank you for that we've got this ticket stub that came through Mike oh right love the show the highlight way. of my week for some strange reason 25p I, <laughs> I said this comes from John Tompkinson thanks John I still have a few ticket stubs from gigs I went to way back then. I just can't bring myself to throw them out. Here's one that I thought might fit in with the show tonight. So Savoy Brown and Chicken Shack. Yeah, yeah, playing together for 25p. Talk about Christine Perfect. (laughs) Yes, all seats and reserved. Okay, the questions, one of many. Hope Mm -hmm. you're patient, Mike. Um, Please, this comes from Dave in Portishead. Please ask Mike Vernon about the live recording of Duster Bennett at the Gin Mill Godalming. Do the tapes still exist? And could a CD be brought out, please, including the audience participation? I suspect that the uh, the tapes do actually still exist. They would be in um, somewhere in a vault uh, in Aylesbury, I think. <laughs> but other than that, I have no idea. There'll be all these cars no moving to Aylesbury right it's, now. Yeah, yeah, I went through all this once before because I had to... Uh, put together the complete Blue Horizon sessions of Duster Bennett yeah. and we turned up a lot of demos and various things that he had at his house 
and um, some of the things were not recorded for us. They were recorded for other companies at a later time be before his untimely death. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I had to make decisions about what I could include and what I couldn't include, and yeah. that was really dictated by the tapes I actually had in my hands at that moment. Yeah. So watch the space, maybe. I don't know if I can go back to all that again. <laughs> <laughs> Chicken Shack, then. You've picked to play Mean Old World. Tell us more about this. Well, I picked that because um, I, I think, actually, uh, Christine featured on a, a lot of songs with the band because she was heavily featured live. And uh, because people loved her, I mean, they, they did. They just loved the idea of a, you know, of a woman playing piano in a blues band. It was like and singing. I mean, she was yeah. a tough singer. Yeah. And this is one of I think the best things that she recorded for us, and it's made doubly better if this is grammatically correct. Yep, by having was... Walter Shaky Horton playing harmonica on it. Yeah. Um, he happened to be uh, in a, in the Europe and in London at that time on one of these American blues festivals. Yeah. And um, I suggested that maybe we could record that this song, which, of course, was a originally was a, a T-Bone Walker song, yeah. but became a song adapted by little Walter. And I knew that Walter Horton was a big fan of the song. I think he'd recorded it too. So we got him to come along. There's a, a quick little story. that When he arrived at the studio, he was he, he was wearing a big overcoat because it was in the winter, yeah. right? And he had a little briefcase and another bag. And in the briefcase, the right the, the right one in his right hand were the harmonicas. We found that out immediately because he tripped over the the board at the doorway and fell flat on his face. <laughs> oh, no. And the, and the Harmonicas flew everywhere, uh, and, 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 and not seemingly and not bothered about any of this. Got himself up, picked all the harmonicas up, and, and said, "Right, that's the one I want." <laughs> Are they in tune? And, <laughs> Are they still uh, working? Uh, fine? No, they're in tune. <laughs> they're all right. <laughs> Let's hear it. You listen to The Blue Show with me, Karis Matthews, and producer uh, Mike Vernon. And I just wondered, Mike, if you remember who was playing on that track? Yep, Dave Bidwell on drums, Andy Sylvester on bass, Stan Weddle on guitar, Christine on piano, and Walter Shaky Horton on harmonica. Do you remember every single person and player on all of the tracks uh, that you recorded? Not every single one, but I do get pretty close. Yeah, that's pretty <laughs> impressive. Listen, some questions. I can't remember what I did yesterday. <laughs> Same cue. <laughs> Martin Denham's got in touch, Mike. I remember buying the single on Blue Horizon back in the day. We're talking about Need Your Love So Bad. Uh, would Mike agree that some of Peter Green's finest blues guitar was while back in some of the visiting American blues guys like Otis Spann? Eddie Boyd, etc. And he goes on to say, I so love Blues for Hippies by Otis Spann. Oh, wow. <laughs> I think he's right. And, I, and I've always felt that. Um, that there was something that uh, could that loosened Peter more when he didn't have, when he didn't have to sing. And he let yeah. the, the real deal guys do it. He did that with um, Eddie Boyd. That album is a very, very strong record, guitar-wise. Well, the album with Otis Spann, for me, is one of the best records that we made at Blue Horizon. And, um, and that is, in terms of guitar playing, both Danny and Peter. Yeah. Because Danny was yeah. at that time was in the band. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree, I'd agree. I'll play, I'll play some, Martin, good idea, and I'll play some next week as well. Um, did he practice all the time, Peter Green? Um... I don't think he practised as much as maybe he ought to have done. Ah. <laughs> because it was noticeable at the beginning of Need Jello So Bad that he was uh, fiddling with a particular lick, yeah. trying to make him remember it. But Get it. Really, he he was one of those guitar players who could play. He didn't. He had a plan, but it, if the plan didn't work, you always had another plan. Yeah, so it's he quite intuitive. Was, it sounds like yeah, it's intuitive. Yeah, he was very. His playing was very fluid. Very fluid. Um, Andy Page, regular listener, and big music fan, has got in touch. Um, ah, where's the, where's the question going here? Uh, does he remember cutting the Marshall Hooks and Co session? Yes, that that one is a little little vague, but it was cut in Los Angeles. Could you tell us anything about Marshall? As details of him are few and far. That's true. He was he. There was quite. There are quite a lot of uh, family members who were musicians. Mm. The Hooks family were mm. quite well known in L.A. Um, 
And uh, I I really like Marshall's. I mean, he had a kind of... Uh, his voice was very a la Otis Redding. Right. But in a bluesier way, perhaps. Well, and he was a good guitar player. Got to get but, some uh, of that music for we next just week. Couldn't, we just couldn't get interest from the public or the promoters to bring him in to promote the record, and the record died a death, unfortunately. Well, I'll play some next week if I can get hold of good some. On you. Maybe you can put, <laughs> push some my ways off. Listen, Mike Vernon, we're going to up the gear a little bit. Lazy Lester, he's called Lazy Lester, but he's up in the tempo. Sugar Coated Love is what we've got lined up to play. Why? Uh, I, I've always liked the song, and I had an opportunity in uh God, where, where, what year was that um i've got it written down somewhere but oh, I'm bored I've got it, some notes as well, um, yeah. it uh, doesn't doesn't matter that much it was in the 70s uh, i'm sure it was in the late 70s i know he was born in 1933 yes okay well that doesn't help <laughs> very much <laughs> but anyway, not people then <laughs> um lester hadn't recorded for oh, many it released for... 1987 on ace record oh, oh no okay, that's I'm a compilation ro- I, that's I a got compilation the seven in the wrong place sorry 87 <laughs> bad, bad on me so um, I, I had an opportunity to record him in England yeah. and uh, we used the uh, Scottish band Blues and Trouble mm-hmm. uh, to do the background and we had a, a you know, a, I forget who the pianist was, he was from Essex um, and he passed away a few years ago, I think I should remember his name, Ian somebody. Anyway, um, we made this album and Ace Records in London yeah. put it out yeah. and uh, it was nominated for a WC Handy Award and it won it. And I, I was as proud as anything, you know, I thought this... And I just love this song, and this is, I think, just as good as the original version. So, my million-dollar question, then, of all the recording sessions you've been privy to and part of, what are the sort of top two or three that... You hold. Oh, well, the Otis Span album that I did with uh, Fleetwood Mac definitely is amongst those. Um, Why? I, I just think because it has so much power and uh, so much there's so, so emotion in the whole record. It's like it's it's just oozing out of the speakers at you, and uh, that's what you want when you are making that kind of a record. You know, is that because the musicians were reacting to each other? Yes, they were. Yeah, and, and the fact that. It, Span actually had his own drummer, S.P. Leary, right. in the studio. And we were in New York doing this with Fleetwood Mac. I mean, at, at, uh, about four or five days later, I think, we were working on Man of the World Whoa. in that in the same studio. Uh-huh. I never got... It, it, that was the basis of it. Yeah. And then came back to London and got finished in London. So were there two drummers in the session? No, no, no. Mick Fleetwood backed out. Oh, OK. Well, I, he didn't really have much choice because I, <laughs> Otis, Otis Spann said, I'm not going <laughs> right. to record if I don't have SP. So I, I had to say to Mick, I'm sorry, but he said, no, 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 it's cool, man. No, no problem, no and, problem. And in terms of sound, like your, your role as engineer, producer and stuff, what did you always return to? What were you looking for? What was the aim of I, the I'm look, looking to get the best performance out of everybody that's possible, you know, and in those days we didn't... We, we, uh, we did do a, the Otis Spann album, actually, I think, on 8-track. Mm. So we had a bit of uh, manoeuvrability afterwards, mix-wise. But the problem was that S.P. Leary was so damn loud. He, yeah. he was really loud. Yeah. And, and the piano lid, of course, was open, and we had to put baffles and stuff all over that and carpets and curtains and everyone knows what. You know. Yeah, because um, you'd often do that if, you, if you're not yeah, familiar with studio stuff, like duvets into yeah, bass drums yeah, and stuff. absolutely. Everybody right does mess. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they didn't do it now because, you know, it's a different world we it's live in. It's a totally different world, isn't it? Yeah. Well, but I wanted to talk to you about fanzines. That feels like a different world, too, doesn't it? Fanzines, oh, yeah, well, that was hard work, I'll tell you. We, we, my brother and I started that in 1962 or 64, was it? Yeah, 64. And um, uh, pff, more hard, hard work. work than dealing with musicians. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you had <laughs> records to review, and you but we had record releases and yeah. interviews, and and yeah. then we had to run it off a, a, a hand uh, printer made, thing, you know, and then stick it together and ta- staple it, and then put it in an envelope and send it. Yeah. Gee, I mean, you know. Well, listen, let's let's bring you rapidly back to 2023. <laughs> then yeah. you're making your own music, you're writing songs, you're yep. playing, you've got a yep. band together. Yep. Well, this is, this is the second attempt in the last seven or eight years. Uh, we, had, we had a we had a good set, set up about uh, up until about five years ago with with the mighty combo. 
Yes. Um, and it, but there was something about it that didn't quite gel for me. Uh, it, was nothing, it was nothing really to do with the musicians. Musicians. It was to do with the choice of material, and mm-hmm. I don't know. I didn't feel that comfortable. And um, I started r- songwriting with Kid Carlos, who's the guitarist in uh, Cat Squirrel. Yeah. And it was a wicked. That player. is the name of the band, Cat, Cat Squirrel. It's good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's yeah, good. I'm, I'm afraid I nicked it from uh, Doctor Ross. Who wrote their song yeah, Cat yeah, Squirrel, yeah. which Cream covered and uh, yeah. Jethro Tull and Blonde yeah. Pig and so on. Um, so uh, yeah, you know, we we came together and wrote a lot of new songs, and then then it suddenly dawned on me that really I I was not, I hadn't been in the right place musically. Yeah. I hadn't gone back to my roots. And now you're there. Yes, because my roots really were John Lee Hooker, Muddy Waters, Robert Johnson, the same thing that made the Rolling Stones. Yeah. Be what they were, and the Yardbirds, you know. Well, let's play it. Please do. So, Mike, you've given me permission to fade it a little bit. Cat Squirrel, this is Let the Boogie Rip. It's from a brand new album, Blues What Am. Yep. Tell us the personnel, some wonderful names in the band. <laughs> okay. Harmonica is uh, Mingo Balagueya. Guitarist is Kit Carlos, upright bass is Oriol Fontanals, and the drummer is uh, Pascual Lamonca. And how can people find out more about the band and when can they see you live? Well, we have a website, we, and, um, we have uh, Facebook, and uh, everything that we're up to is on there. And we have more gigs in Spain up until the new year, and then we have more gigs in Spain starting in the early spring. But we are talking about perhaps doing some concerts in uh, Scandinavia, uh, France, and maybe even in the United Kingdom toward the end of the year. Well, thank you so much for coming in and sharing some of your record collection. A pleasure. pleasure. Your your memories.